How's it going, everybody? My name is Antonio, and I'm on the barbecue today on November 2 with Mike O'Connor, the president and CEO of Vizsla Silver, a uh, silver and gold exploration and development company with an assets in Sinaloa, Mexico. Who's not here with us today, though, is your financial advisor. This conversation is not going to include any recommendations for you to do anything, so not to buy or sell anything. Instead, it will be a casual talk between two people who you've likely never met. And if you haven't been burned before, you're not supposed to listen to strangers. Um, So for as far as you as a listener or viewer are concerned, this is going to be a conversation that's general and impersonal nature. And it's definitely not a conversation that you want to use as independent research, because it's also going to include a lot of forward-looking statements about uncertain events that may or may not happen in the future. Please take a minute to pause the video right now. There's a full warning on your screen that um, you can read because the mineral exploration, um, uh, the development and mining industries, they're among the highest risk industries out there because that, so so that basically means that um, you risk a permanent loss of capital if you don't do more research by visiting setter.com and analyzing the company's official filings, as well as, of course, consult a professional investment advisor before taking your own decision in the end. That all said, Visa Silver is listed on the TSX Ventures Exchange under the ticket symbol VZLA, where an average of about 120,000 shares trade each day, uh, with a market cap of about 300 million Canadian dollars and about 208 million shares outstanding. This is a $1 and um, 40, give or take, so $1, $41.42 stock with a 52 week high of $2.24 and a 52 week low of $1.26. There are about 15 million warrants as well as uh, 20 million stock options for a total fully diluted number at about 242 million shares. The stock, by the way, also, also trades on the New York Stock Exchange under the same ticker symbol, so VZLA. About 15% of the company is owned by management and directors. Almost 60% is owned by institutions and high net worth um, individuals. And the rest would be, well, retail or or other um, institutions that could not be tracked. Back in June, um, actually in July, Vizsla had uh, under a million dollars in cash, but about $40 million in short-term investments and about $20 million in short-term receivables, as well as a $2.5 million in uh, prepaid expenses. Um, all of that liquidity is against about five and a half million dollars in uh, accounts payables and no long-term debt. As I said at the beginning, um, Visla has a project in Mexico, specifically West Central Mexico, close to a um, four-century-old silver mining town that's called Capala, and um, about that's about eighty kilometers south as the crow flies uh, away from the first Majestics mine. Uh, I believe it's called San Dimas. So this is a um, the, the, this year, where, where the company's base is a past producing, so a historical district of Mexico, they were mining silver here as, as, as far back as the 1500s. And today it's mostly a tourist spot, but also still mining and uh, some agriculture. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it's close to the city of um, um, Mazatlan, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, which is it's it, um, on on the coast basically, and uh, Vizsla's land package here is uh, it, well, it spans seven thousand two hundred hectares or about uh, seventy two kilometers uh, square kilometers. That is, so it is not immense. It's not huge, but it's also not small. But it does host an indicated mineral resource of almost one hundred and five million ounces of contained silver equivalent. That equivalent, by the way, is fifty five percent silver, and the rest is mostly gold. But then there's also uh, a little bit of lead and a little bit of zinc in here too as well. Um, with the average grade being 437 grams of silver equivalent per ton. And if you want to translate that to gold, that'd be about 5.8 grams of gold equivalent. And then there is another about 115 million, so 115 million ounces of contained silver equivalent in the inferred category. And that is over 60% silver with most of the rest being gold. And again, some um, uh, same as the previous one here, so some lead and some zinc as well. With the average grade on the inferred being 490 grams per ton of silver equivalent, which translates to um, gold at about six and a half grams. Mineralization here is associated with um, Eocene volcanic intrusions, which means that this is, um, well, oftentimes it means that this is a vein-hosted mineralization system. It is mostly narrower veins here that are uh, that are present, uh, but there is about 85 kilometers of them too. With the land package being in uh, a historical mining district, you could also expect that there is some mining infrastructure here, both under and, and, and above ground. And uh, so Vizsla also owns a processing facility that is capable of uh, milling 500 tons per day. 
And um, this is one of the the, the few. So, so there there are other mills in the area also of that similar size. So, this is sort of two hundred to seven hundred TPD. Since the mineral resource update uh, was released in early 2023, which, by the way, was based on uh, 200,000 meters of drilling spread over 638 holes, Fisla had uh, has continued drilling. So um, there's been, I believe, some 50,000 or so meters have, have been drilled since this resource update with the idea of drilling 90,000 meters this year. And uh, they've also made two new... Um, well, they they are basically expanding uh, the mineralized zone here, but also more recently announcing uh, the discovery of a new mineralized zone, which is located about 250 meters west of that uh, Kapala resource that I told you about, as well as some metallurgical testing has been completed, showing 91% recoveries for silver and 94% recoveries for gold, with uh, another updated resource expected by the end of this year and a PEA expected uh, sometime next year. So all that about feels like... Uh, Enough hearing of my own voice. Seems like I've been talking enough. So I'll shut up now and give Mike here a, a sizzling welcome to the barbecue. Mike, thank you for investing your time in me, sir. Thank you very much, Antonio. It's great to be here. Pleasure is all mine, of course. What am I? Uh, what am I missing here in the overview? Of something that I'm getting wrong? Well, you know, you, you touched on a lot of those important points. You know what? What Vizla and the Panuco district is to me is a very large, uh, high grade silver district, you know, silver gold district, and uh, very similar to San Dimas. And San Dimas is about 80 kilometers away as a crow flies. And I think you, you, looking at the value that, that San Dimas created for shareholders and investors over <clears throat> several decades uh, recently, uh, you know, gives a, a hint towards what's possible here with, with our company. But to start, our, our vision is to become one of the world's largest silver primary single asset producers through our project. Um, you know, looking at what San Dimas has uh, accomplished, you know, it was basically a, a mine for a company called Luzman, a private Mexican mining company for um, centuries, or sorry, I should say for, for decades, but it had been in production, you know, commercially for a century. Um, it was then acquired by Ian Telfer and Frank Justra in Wheaton River, which then became Goldcorp, and it was a cash flow engine that that, that built Goldcorp. And then those gentlemen uh, took a, a stream out on uh, San Dimas and created Wheaton Precious Metals out of that. Now, Wheaton Precious Metals is one of the largest, uh, you know, revenue companies in the mining space with the with the fewest employees. It's a it's a you know interesting stat, uh, but they've created a, a huge amount of cash flow out of uh, out of uh, that stream actually for for their company, and that's what started Wheaton Precious Metals. So, you know, we do know that. There are 15 billion ounce districts in the world. Nine of them are in Mexico. Mexico is a top producer of, of, of silver. Uh, so if you want silver, Mexico is the, probably the best place to go for single asset producers, uh, silver primary producers. And, um, you know, we think that we have a, a very good shot at, at becoming, you know, the 16th billion ounce district uh, in the world here with, uh, with our project and creating value uh, for shareholders like, uh, like, we, like uh, San Dimas has in the past. Right. I do want to touch upon uh, that single asset producer thing that you have in your presentation as well. Uh, but we, we've sort of, you know, we heard the positives um, and, and that's, uh, I assume, what you enjoy talking about. But no stake is perfect, as I like saying. So let's uh, let's talk about some of the risks or, or me Main things, I guess, that keep you up at night, and and maybe you can give me just sort of three company specific things that you would change, uh, you know, challenges that you would make go away if you could do so by the push of a magic button. Well, you know, the first is is always pretty topical. Um, you know, unfortunately, in this business, you know, we, we're we're not a cash flowing company, so we have to dilute something to accomplish our goals. So. We either have to dilute the equity uh, through equity financings, and and that's painful for me. It keeps me up at night because I've, I'm the founder of the company, and and I wrote the first check and bought the first shares. Uh, so you know, I hate I hate dilution uh, just as much as any other shareholder does. Um, so you know, financing that's something that keeps me up. Uh, the markets are are difficult. Fortunately, we've been able to raise over two hundred million dollars for this company in the last you know several years. And uh, through those financings, we've been able to welcome some excellent shareholders. So we have, you know, very strong shareholder list. It includes Franklin Templeton, Fidelity, um, For Sale, uh, the Sprott organization, including Eric Sprott as well, and, and, and many others. So, um, but still, you know, how do we go from 
the cash that we have in hand right now um, through to the objectives that we have for the next year and a half uh, on our way to a feasibility study post a PEA or on, on capital markets. Uh, you know, the other I would say is safety. Safety is always important. Um, this is a, an area in Mexico that has a lot of historic mining. Um, so we're actually out there in the, in the field looking for old workings and it's, you know, it's thick, you know, thick jungle in some cases, depending on the time of year. So, you know, it's really important that we, we make sure our people are safe and, and in contact all the time. Uh, but we have, you know, 1.6 million hours LTI free, which is an incredible streak. Um, our total recorded incident rate is, is uh, one, one tenth, 10% of the average in Mexico. Um, so we have an incredible safety record, but safety keeps me up at night as well. I want to make sure everybody uh, in our organization comes home from work, of course, every at the end of the day. And then, you know, the third is, is something that uh, we just can't control, a mining reform, a change to the mining reform, and uh, sorry, a change to the mining laws to be a reform. And, um, you know, although it didn't have any impact on us because we are, we're grandfathered under the, the, the previous rules, you know, it does scare uh, investor sentiment. Uh, that's starting to, to, to improve, I, I think, you know, when, when, when investors realize that, uh, first of all, it's not applicable to existing uh, concessions, and then it looks like it'll be repealed. But, you know, um, governments all around the world aren't making mining easier. It's becoming more challenging everywhere in the world, uh, except for Saudi Arabia, I think. And, um, you know, it's just something that we deal with and, and how you offset that is to have excellent community support, which we have, uh, excellent Ahito relationships, which we have. We have long-term production agreements signed with the local landowners and, uh, and then create great relationships with the government as well, too. So I, I often travel to Culiacan, the state capital of Sinaloa, and, uh, and meet with the government there. And, and uh, you know, we've, we've always been uh, efficient in getting permits and, and things like that. So, you know, the indications are that uh, we have, you know, great relationship with, uh, with authorities and, and uh, the agencies that we need to. Mm -hmm. Again, a couple of things to touch upon, uh, specifically locals, authorities, and so on and so forth. But let's maybe take it from the top and, and talk sort of about what the, what the strat the end goal here is. The strategies, um, I mean, I don't think the strategy has been unclear or anything like that with you. Is it's literally the third slide of your investor presentation where you say that, quote, Fizzler's vision is to become one of the world's largest single uh, asset um, silver primary producers, unquote, and a bunch of other stuff. But so what I want to what I want to ask you is why why single asset, given the given what you told me, actually, just now the recent history of single asset producers focused on one single jurisdiction has been turbulence to put it mildly so so why that strategy well you know there's there's two companies that uh have gone before us in recent days in mexico and created a, a lot of value and actually our, our charts are very similar to these two companies um you know they one has gone from 25 cents to 16 dollars, and the other went from you know 50 cents to almost 30 dollars. so um those are silvercrest and meg silver both single asset um silver primary producers in mexico and, um, you know, for us, we look at this district and, and we think, okay, well, you know, first of all, we, 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 we have the desire and the, the team and the board and, and the drive to, uh, to put this through, through into production and become a large scale producer at a time when the world needs more silver. I think that's topical. Uh, I think that silver is massively undervalued and to, you know, maximize reward for our shareholders. We, we, um, you know, we push forward towards production and, and into production and, and generate massive cash flow from this project. But the reason why, you know, we would want to do that and, and not acquire other assets or kind of diversify is, is, as I said, you know, Mexico is the Mecca for silver. It's where you go if you want to build a silver company. Um, you know, it's been done many times before with, with projects in some ways similar to, to Vizla where, you know, you have past production history and, and, and consolidation creates value, which is what we did here at this project. Um, but, you know, when we look at our district, there's our center of mass, which is in the West and includes Copala and Napoleon and, and uh, several other veins. And if you were to drop a pin in the middle of that, draw a four kilometer radius, you'd, you'd encompass about 96% of our resources. So pretty much all of our resources sit in the West. Uh, we call that our center of mass. Now, Dr. Peter Maga and our vice president of exploration, Jesus Velador, who actually worked together at, at, at Juan Escipio for, for MAG, making the discovery of, of Juan Escipio for MAG, 
have collaborated again now here, uh, kind of like getting the band back together and are looking at this whole district and thinking, okay, there's a center of mass in the West. There's a swarm of veins here. There's a swarm of veins here. This is an interesting structure. How do we find the next center of mass? So instead of going and diluting the, the company, um, you know, to acquire another asset in some other jurisdiction, we would like to focus on, you know, the great work that we've done in consolidating this ground, uh, our knowledge base on on this, you know, Sinaloa Silver Trend, i.e., our project, and um, and make new discoveries because we know it's a fertile uh, area to make new discoveries. It's it's you know it's it's massive. It's the size of the island of Manhattan. All of our resources sit basically in the financial district in the Lower East Side, and we've got the rest of the island to explore. Is a way that we look at it. And um, we've barely scratched the surface. We've, we've only drilled 10% of the veins. Yeah, so there, there is a whole lot more to be done. And although I understand that that's, um, I mean, that, that, that's what a strategy should be, right? Because aiming for a takeover, aiming, you know, b building for a sale is, is almost never a good strategy is what, I, what I've been told. Um, but is that completely off the table you i mean would you personally and therefore the rest of the team who again they own you, you guys own about 15 percent of the company would you specifically vote against a takeover uh personally if if one were to you know if an offer were to come at at, at the current market cap or, or even slightly higher i think you know what we would look at um you know, are, are in any situation, it's important for a company to look at what are the near term milestones that those going to create value for shareholders. And if there are some obvious milestones that create value for shareholders, then it doesn't make sense to sell at a depressed level, you know, and for us, we have, you know, two major milestones in the next, uh, well, let's say, you know, first of all, we're expecting a mineral resource update in the early part of next year. And then following that sometime in 2024, we expect a PEA. So, you know, those are, those are, you know, things that materially impact our value. And uh, it's important for us to, uh, to make sure that, that those uh, are published before entertaining uh, a sale. And, and the only reason that we would, we would entertain a sale, you know, and re review that, uh, you know, is, is uh, if it's something that, that creates value for shareholders and it's comparable to the value that you can create uh, by accomplishing these goals and, and, and moving into production. So, um, you know, we're, we're a competent board with a lot of capital markets experience and a lot of business experience. So, you know, we're, we're responsible in the sense that we would have to review any offer. Um, but, you know, we're also confident in the fact that we can unlock a huge amount of value. Right now, I think, you know, we're trading a small percentage of what I believe our, our true value is. And I, I often say that we're criminally undervalued. And uh, I, I think, you know, shareholders would, would absolutely deserve um, uh, a much larger market cap than we have right now in any in any type of offer. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Did you say updated MRE early next year? Because at the beginning, I I said that it should have been by the end of this year. Because that's when I figure out. But what what is your just so we can get that out of the way? Yeah. So we're we're expecting an early early next year. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. We'll 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 be we'll be talking about that as well, of course. But so why I asked you the question of of what would you personally vote or what what the plan really here is because obviously bidding a mine and a mill combo uh, capable of, of handling the, the the quantities that you want to handle is is not going to be cheap like it's not going to be the most expensive thing ever because it, obviously this is not it's not an uber deep deposit to mexico and so on and so forth we do have a deal from from the past done in mexico i believe that that was the uh mag for sneo deal which arguably did not optimize value for shareholders to the maximum so what could I mean, if it's not if it's not a, a a full buyout, would you entertain the idea of a partner, or are you sort of dead set on no? You know, I'm I have invented capital behind me. I can finance this. I want to finance it myself, and I want to be a mining company. Well, we absolutely do want to be a mining company, um, but again, it's you know from from my perspective, it's uh, it's not necessarily about my personal aspirations or what's best for me. It's it's about you know what what's best for our shareholders. And as you said, there's you know, 60% institutional and high net worth uh, shareholders. So, you know, th th we need to explore, uh, you know, the, the value that it, something, you know, hypothetically creates for, uh, for other shareholders and, and, and not be entrenched management. That's, that's all part of being responsible and having an independent board. So, um, you know, my, my personal 
desires and aspirations, uh, you know, certainly would be to to build a, you know, a very successful mining company out of Isla. Again, I'm, you know, the founder of the company and that would be spectacular to do. But I, 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 you know, I would never put my own aspirations ahead of, um, you know, shareholders. Uh, you know, we have a fiduciary duty uh, to, to shareholders to, uh, to maximize value. Fair point. And this is also all in, in the realm of speculation. This is the forward-looking statements that I was referring to at the beginning, uh, and it's all hypothetical, of course. Um, it, w- w- what's your what's your average cost of uh, of your shares, by the way, as the founder of the company? Um, I believe it's around twenty five or thirty cents. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then there's so options. I, I, yeah, options. Okay. Uh, they, um, you know, I have. I, I mean, I've, I've, I've. This is my job for the last five years, so I've uh, accrued some some options, um, and and you know, I have a lot of exposure uh, via options, which is which is an excellent way to incentivize mm-hmm. management as well. Um, but uh, you know, we've been buying the stock. Uh, I, I I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars of of uh, insider buying since we started the company on market. So. Um, and then, and then our director, Simon Smirlock just bought $50,000 worth, um, you know, I think on Friday last week. And then, uh, you know, Craig, actually our chairman at one point in 2021, you know, markets were flying and our stock price was, was doing very well, $2 and 50 cents. Uh, Craig put in about four and a half million dollars uh, into that placement, uh, and, and, and bought some more on the market. So we're, we're definitely, um, higher ACB. Than most mining companies, in the sense that we, you know, we bought at higher levels than than today's prices, even mostly. Right. Okay. Thank you for that answer. Let's do talk about building a mining company in Mexico, and and um, I guess the first thing that that's very topical to talk about right now is is the locals sort of roaming your your lands there, because I believe your your project is also used for cattle grazing, not a lot, but then I mean, there's a town there, there's people who live there. How would like how would the lock the locals lo- look upon a, a potential mine being set up there? And again, I understand that they're not blocking you or anything like that right now, and you're in good standing with them. But having a mine is also different than having an exploration company. So is it something you've discussed with them already? Well, yes. Uh, so we actually have thirty year agreements for production. Um, there's a few things to to note here. Uh, one is that this this district was discovered by a gentleman named Francisco Diabara in 1565, I believe. And since then, it's been small scale mining for, for four centuries. So uh, this is a mining mining district. Uh, all of the people that we hire and, and work, that work for us from the community, about 200 people um, directly from the communities in, in the area, uh, pretty much all have, you know, historic mining experience. So you're the underground miners or gambesinos or, you know, what have you. Uh, so it's, it's like, a, it's a truly a mining district. So that's helpful. Um, you know, underground mines in Mexico don't have a huge footprint. And, um, you know, it's not like a gaping hole in, in the earth. Um, you know, small, re- reasonable size at it, uh, maybe several at it throughout the, the district. And then a, a central milling and processing facility. You know, that uh, the topography here is, 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 is helpful. It's rolling hills. And, um, you know, there's certainly topography that you could, you know, put a, a mill in a tailings area in and, and and basically have it out of sight from the highways or the the neighborhoods in the area, which is is also positive. Um, but really, what what we're intent on doing is is creating value for those the, you know the local people there. They they look to San Dimas and they see the value that San Dimas has created for the communities there. The high paying jobs, um, you know, training, standard of living increasing. You know, even the fact that we've spent over a hundred million dollars in this community already. Um, you know, exploring has created a lot of value uh, for uh, for the communities, and so they they see that. And a lot of times they ask us, "When are we? When, when's the mine going to start?" You know, they're excited about it. Is there? Uh, it's always interesting looking at the local communities and how you know the companies influence those local communities. Have there have there been any new businesses or anything that's been popping up since since you arrived? Um, you know, that's something that we're actually exploring uh, as part of our, our ESG initiative, uh, you know, creating, you know, it's kind of funny because, you know, oftentimes the, the whole rhetoric around, you know, doing value added businesses in the in the community is to say, well, what happened, you know, this is for when the mine shuts down in, you know, 20, 30 years or, or whatever, when the mine life runs out. 
you know, we had someone uh, very senior in, in the Mexican mining industry, very well known in the Mexican mining industry, come to the project. And we were talking about this and he says to us, you know, I don't think you have to worry about this. Santa Mass has been in production for 100 years. You know, this is the type of thing that, that, that continues, you know, on com commercial production for, for centuries. So um, that might sound a bit exaggerated, but, you know, the value here, I think, is is creating a, a mine that has a long lasting, um, you know, life cycle and uh, creates value for uh, for the communities. But what we have been looking at is, um, you know, we have a nursery that we've we've started where we're, we're growing plants that we'll use to replace and, and fix the uh, disturbed areas as we as we proceed. And, you know, there could be some way to monetize that. Uh, we've explored how to improve the uh, subsistence uh, agriculture, the, the cattle ranching, the small cattle ranching in the area. So there's things like that. But, you know, as we move into production, that becomes more important. So over the next year and a half or two years, something that we're really um, focusing on. But the key is to do something that, that's actually meaningful. And, and in order to do something meaningful, it takes a bit of research and um, and, and and dialogue with the, the community. So we don't want to rush into something and say, hey, by the way, this is your new, you know, your new business. Uh, enjoy. You know, you want to do something that, 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 that aligns with the values of the communities. I was just thinking of, of looking up um, and I did earlier, but I couldn't find it. How many people live in Kupala? Do you know by heart? Uh, it's It would be between 300 and 400, I would say. So it's really um, small. Yeah, yeah. And then there's probably another couple hundred people that live in Panuco, which is across on the north side of the highway. Right. And then there's there's a, a town that we have our core warehouse in about 20 minutes away uh, called Concordia. Concordia would be in the in the tens of thousands. It's it's uh, yeah. you know, it's not a sprawling city, but it's a nice community and uh, you know, has everything. That's where our our our, our crew has uh, accommodations there and um, you know, we we've, we've we've had to buy multiple warehouses in the in the area to store all of our core, which we've drilled now over 300,000 meters. So we're kind of a, we're a bit of a force in that, in that community. And I sat down with the director of economy uh, in, in Culiacan a couple months ago, and he had pulled up all the stats on, on jobs. And he said, well, thank you for creating, you know, the most uh, high pain and, you know, uh, you know, I guess not sophisticated, what's the right word, but um, you know, meaningful jobs here uh, in all of the municipalities uh, across Sinaloa. So th they've taken notice of that, and we've we've created a lot of value for for Concordia as well. But I assume most of your services that you buy come from Mazatlan, then. Well, um, yeah, the, we we have a drill contractor that's called Maza Drilling. So they're just you know they're based in Mazatlan. Uh, we have two others that that compete. You know, they're all trying to get the lowest uh, cost for us. So it's good to have multiple contractors uh, working on a project. And um, you know, we 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 do spend a fair amount of time in Mazatlan when we have investors and and, and the board to the project because it's only about an hour away, and it's you know it's very easy to get from uh, Mazatlan to the the project just up the highway. But we really draw on. Uh, you know, supplies or, or or expertise from many different places in Mexico. A lot of our people are, are people from Chihuahua and Sonora, which are more established mining states. And then we, you know, there's there's uh, supplies that we get from Durango, which is about 350 kilometers away on the highway. So just a few hours away. So it's, uh, you know, Sinaloa is really a, a well-located place, um, you know, to do this because you have, first of all, you have a lot of really strong mining culture in the area, you know, our area, uh, Panuco, Copala, and then Rosario to the south have been for, for centuries, you know, a big part of the mining industry. And, and it was only in the last maybe 15 years where there was, uh, you know, um, a bit more violence uh, about 10 years ago in, uh, in various states that, you know, exploration slowed down and, and people kind of moved away from, from Sinaloa. When we showed up about five years ago, uh, that perception was still there that Sinaloa is dangerous and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But that's what that perception was actually what created the uh, the opportunity for us because, you know, if this project was in Durango or Sonora, it would likely be owned by Agnico Eagle or Fresnillo or, or, or you know, Mega Mining Company. But the fact that um, it was in Sinaloa, it was fragmented land ownership, um, difficult group to do to do deals with. 
um, you know, created an opportunity for for us and myself to to spend about a year uh, working with the various uh, families and, and landowners and uh, being able to pull this deal together, which was which was challenging. But you know, what we found is is that Sinaloa is actually a, a really wonderful place to operate. Uh, it's safe. It's consistently ranked one of the, the safest states, which is funny because every time people turn on Netflix, it's Chapo and Narcos, and you know, it has this kind of mystique to it, Sinaloa. Um, but in reality, it's a great place to work. And, and what people consider, you know, the, the blue chip mining states in, uh, in Mexico are actually the most dangerous, like Zacatecas. Fresnillo is, is, is having a very difficult time right now, um, you know, the, the, the city of Fresnillo. And, um, you know, Sonora and Chihuahua are actually quite dangerous as well, too. So, um, you know, we, we actually love being a part of Sinaloa and we love to... Um, consider ourselves, uh, you know, part of that, that state and, and that culture there. Mm. Well, you make a, you, you make a good point or you raise, or you bring up a good point because when I hear Sinaloa for me, for, for some reason, the word cartel immediately pops up in my head. Um, yeah. well, not for some reason it's, it's due to popular culture, of course. And so I, I actually looked it up when I was looking, when I was looking into the company and it turned, well, it's, it's an actual thing. Like the cartel exists and, uh, th- yeah. they are, maybe not as active anymore or not. I, I don't know how that works. I obviously wouldn't have an insight, probably wouldn't be here, but I, I'm not sure I can fully wrap my head around what that means for your day-to-day operation specifically, if anything, as well as what it means for the project, if it were to become a mine, because again, two different things. So maybe you can talk to me more about that. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't, you know, I don't like to kind of speculate on unorganized crime and things like that. But what we can uh, what we can look at is, you know, the success of uh, of other projects in in the area. Um, you know, the fact that we've operated for three plus years now without a security team, without armed guards. Um, you know, people are we never had an incident. Uh, you know, it's been been safe for us. Uh, and I, you know, the other thing is I brought my my family down to the project. I have a great photo of my, my son and I on the discovery hole caller, um, you know, from a couple of years ago. So I, I certainly wouldn't be taking my family somewhere that, 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 that was, you know, I considered dangerous. I go there all the time. Um, and I've never had any issues, but you know, these are all kind of, you know, those are personal anecdotes, I suppose, but, um, in reality, you know, mining, is something that creates value for the communities. And, um, you know, I think the, the, the prospect of creating jobs for people is, is something that I think a lot of people in, in Mexico appreciate. And, and um, you know, I, I don't foresee any issues with, um, you know, any type of uh, problems when we move into production. You know, there's, there's countless mines operating all throughout Mexico and in more dangerous states, um, more challenged states that... Uh, that operate, you know, perfectly fine. So, um, you know, I think what we've done early on, which is create the the communication, uh, the relationships with our, our local communities and the government is, is very useful and helpful in this as well. So, so why I'm asking that is because to, to a, a, a snowflake European desktop researcher like myself has never been anywhere that th- these things are like, and I'm sure I'm not alone, but I, these things are, uh, you know, thoughts that you're that you're having. Well, like, well, what's the situation in the ground? But you bring up a good point. Like you wouldn't bring your family there if it weren't safe. So, well, as far as I'm understanding so far, like there's absolutely no influence or anything on your day to day operations. Like you've not been in touch with any of any of that. No, no, we we um, you know we operate just normally. You know, the guys mm-hmm. drive up from Concordia, and we have safety meetings on the side of the highway. Um, you know, in a big kind of cleared area underneath the tree and we're, we're all, you know, we're all out in the open and driving around with, with Beasley trucks and we're just a part of the community. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Well, thank you for the overview and providing sort of eyes on the ground. What is the, uh, the land package that you have right now, as you mentioned, the resources is, is situated on, you, you separated on your map sort of in, in three parts and your resource situated on the Western side of your land package. Um, I believe you're paying semi-annual Mexican property tax for for um, for the rest of, so for the total. I believe that was three hundred thousand Canadian dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, for for a year, right? That's what basically what you're paying. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what's the what, what's the what's the plan here for for this land package? Obviously, you have an investment that you can talk to me about that is related to it, but is is expansion more likely or is focusing in on one part and letting maybe some of the concessions expire more likely? Which, which one of those two? Well, 
you know, I, I, I feel like I'm going to be the, the first to, to coin this phrase here, the Sinaloa silver belt. Um, you know, and I think what we, what we have is the, the, the creation or the building of a, a silver belt here. And uh, so we add concessions. We've added probably about 1,500 hectares over the last uh, couple of years by piecing together some smaller concessions around the fringes and, and within our, our property package. Um, you know, I, I love the idea of continuing to expand uh, our, our property. And that's why we did that deal with Prismo, um, you know, to, uh, to get a rofer on their, their project. And, um, you know, we, we continue to, uh, to, to look at opportunities to expand our, our footprint here and, and elsewhere in, in kind of the, the general vicinity of our, uh, of our project. But the, the strategy and the vision for us, the goals, uh, all have to do with discovery and de-risk, discover and de-risk. And, and it's a dual path to, to creating value. Um, we want to, you know, de-risk the resources that we have. So that's, you know, bringing them through studies and showing that they're economically viable. And then we want to make new discoveries elsewhere uh, on our map too. You know, we, we've got our center of mass in the West. Um, I think there's going to be multiple centers of mass throughout the, the district. And, you know, whether they're all brought to our mill uh, in the West and center, you know, in kind of a central processing uh, facility, or you know, maybe some of them are even standalone operations in the future with uh, with another mill. Um, but this is a huge district. You know, it, it looks small, I suppose, on the map in the sense that you know, you look at it, you go seventy two hundred hectares. Some some projects are hundred thousand hectares, uh, but we've got seventy two hundred hectares of you know core mining concessions where there's hundreds of concessions and there have been hundreds of owners of them historically. Um, that we've all consolidated into one one property package. Um, so it's it's um, you know so some companies may have hundred thousand hectares, and only a thousand hectares are are worthwhile keeping. You know we have seventy two hundred hectares. We're looking to grow it, and it's all worthwhile keeping. So we want to uh, explore it and and continue to grow. But you know the the holding costs are are reasonable for for Mexico. Um, you know anytime you have uh, concessions that are kind of progressing and moving forward anywhere in the world, you know, your holding costs uh, increase. Um, but uh, ours, uh, ours, I think are quite reasonable. Mm. And you bring up a good point when you mentioned hundreds of owners, um, because it also, as I mentioned, so silver mining in, in that part of Mexico has, has, you know, existed for a whole lot for centuries, as you mentioned, and this very town uh, dates back to the mid 1500s. So how, how, how is there even something left for you to to mine or to discover? And is is there a particular reason why it's it's one it's not being mined out already, and two nobody was able to pick up or consolidate that land package before you did? Well, others had tried, you know. So so Silverstone, which was a subsidiary of Capstone, uh, at one point had a few concessions, including the La Colorada. Uh, vein that they put a small resource on and then left. They, they ended up selling, uh, turning into a royalty company and then, and then selling to uh, wheat and precious metals, I believe at some point. And, um, uh, you know, so that's a good example. So they drilled, they, they spent, you know, I don't know, a few million bucks drilling off the Colorado and um, put a resource there. And then all the kind of local guys came and mined it out, um, you know, in a couple of years, I think. So they are, you know, it is it is an area where people mine, and uh, we believe there's been about 100 million ounces of silver equivalent taken out of um, kind of main mining areas in the district. But you got to remember, you know, this is a huge district. There's, just despite it being a sidewalk mining project, um, there are areas here that uh, you know people have never set foot on. I'm sure um, it's 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 accessible but it's rugged and it's it's you know it's a wild area in the sense of the vegetation and things like that so there is absolutely the opportunity you know to make big discoveries like we did at copala uh that was a blind to surface discovery but just to go back i should just explain you know the the, the method and and um you know historic mining in the area is all basically optical you know you could come along and you know the you, they're familiar with a, a trend. Um, there's a trend called the Animus trend. It's about an eight kilometer long vein that runs through the middle of our, our project. And, you know, you see some relief in the mountains, you have a shiny vein and you just start mining. And, you know, there's, there's some beautiful, you know, ballroom size uh, void spaces where they've mined out on multiple levels there. And that's where the majority of that hundred million ounces have come from. But that's just one of our, you know, 
dozens and dozens of veins that run through the property and, and it's, you know, eight kilometers of almost a hundred kilometers of cumulative strike that we have there. This is a, just a massively mineralized area. So despite that um, mining at, um, uh, at Animus, you know, no one ever really mined out in the West or even the far East part of our property. It was all kind of centralized all around Animus because there's a lot of material there and, you know, you come across it and you, you start to mine and you lose the vein or you go down to the water table and can't pump it. So you go to the next one and do the same thing. And, and um, you know, there's just an abundance of uh, mineralization here. I, like I said, I, I'm convinced it's going to be one of these billion ounce districts in Mexico, but more to the point of, of how we can make these big discoveries here. Again, you know, what I describe is just, it, it occurs on such a small portion of the overall structures and no money is ever really invested into exploration. It's all, you know, seeing a vein and then, chasing it down and 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 mining it hmm. you know what we did differently is uh drilling uh, of course and and uh and we're the only group to ever put a geological map in this in this district as well too which is like exploration 101 um we're only about 60 percent done that map so far and we've been at it for a couple of years um so what we've done is is basically we we've looked at um different ways to target mineralization uh, the first is that we, you know, we do a combination of mapping, sampling, prospecting, and, and find the high-grade areas, and then bring a drill rig and drill uh, targets that, that uh, you know, that we believe are, are, are have potential to have, you know, large amounts of economic uh, mineralization. And, uh, you know, we've had a lot of success with that. We, we made the discovery of Napoleon underneath an old working, and for some reason that working only went down about 40 meters or so, and they stopped. And turns out that Napoleon is a three kilometer long vein that goes down for 600 meters in depth and still open at depth. That's just as, as much as we've drilled. And it's incredibly high grade and, and very thick. It's, you know, three and a half meters thick, which is like twice the average thickness of veins in Mexico. So that was a great surprise. You know, we, we, we drilled that it turned into a huge resource. And I think it'll be, you know, probably a hundred million ounce uh, structure in this upcoming resource on its own. Uh, so Napoleon's great. And then we were drilling Tejitos, which was uh, another vein that we discovered underneath an old working. Made a discovery there, some extremely high grade, beautiful vein, three meters thick, so you know, half a meter narrower than, um, than Napoleon, but uh, still twice the average thickness of mines in, in Mexico. And uh, as we were drilling into Tejitos, um, we hit this huge you know, intercept it was like 82 meters true thickness. And we, we and it was great, great. It was like just about 200 grams silver equivalent over 82 meters. Like, holy cow, what is this? This isn't Tejitos. And, uh, you know, figured out that this is actually a blind to surf, and meaning that it doesn't outcrop massive thick structure uh, called Copala. And, you know, that was just incredible. So we, we kept stepping along Copala and, and growing that resource. Now it's a mile long, it's still open, long strike in each direction and it's 10 meters thick on average and it's incredibly high grade well over half a kilo and um you know it, it, like that was just blind it was sitting there under the ground it'll probably be hundreds of millions of ounces of silver equivalent in the future it was just sitting there not that far from copala town even and um you know no one ever found it before and then we're, we're uh, you know, dr trying to find a place for the mill location. So we're doing what they call condemnation drilling, which is specifically going out and trying to find an area where there isn't silver. And then we, we, we uh, you know, made the discovery of the Molino vein, which is like 400 meters to the west of Copala. And, you know, like these are, we're just continually finding high grade veins here, um, you know, next to old workings next to uh, our existing resources. It's just a uh, very, very prospective and, and intensely mineralized part of the world for whatever reason, you know, just because of plate tectonics and, and uh, you know, things that happened millions and millions of years ago. This is an area where a lot of uh, mineralized fluid was deposited and, and uh, redeposited and there's multiple mineralizing events. And, you know, we're fortunate enough that, um, you know, we spent the $43 million and the, uh, the, you know, the year of, uh, of my time uh, consolidating this, this district back in, in 2019. So, um, you know, we're, we're incredibly fortunate, but the, you know, the, the good luck I think comes from us being 
uh, you know, persistent and then using really good science and having an extremely talented, uh, you know, scientific and exploration team uh, mm -hmm. at the project. Where are you going to put them, Bill, Mike? I mean, if you, have, you, haven't found, you haven't found a spot. What happens if you don't we, find we, one? We, That'd be a good problem you know, to have. We, uh, we, yeah, exactly. Find out you can never put a mill down. Um, we, uh, you know, fortunately we had a few different locations. So we ended up, uh, I think on the third attempt, we found a place that was, mm. uh, uh, suitable to, uh, to put the mill. Okay. But just sort of to go back to, you know, jokes aside to go back to the locos, uh, it's basically, all, you know, based on the veins that you found, you found, well, as I said, 86, I believe. Uh, kilometers of veins and you said there's an eight kilometer vein that they found in mine so well let's call it about 10 less than 10 percent basically and i kind of assumed that it might have been the width of the veins because they you know you did mention you have some of those are three meters but not sort of the average width of your veins is not three meters if i'm not mistaken and it's it's a tip it's 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 um characterized by a rather narrow vein so i assume that might have been a thing and that's potentially something that you uh, well, not potentially, but something that you're certainly going to have to deal with. Um, it and how are you going to do that? I mean, in in terms of minimizing the dilution that comes with narrower veins, how are you going to be dealing with that? Well, we're we're fortunate because our average thickness, you're right, isn't uh, three meters. It's it's a lot thicker. Um, so Copala is ten meters thick, and that's half of our our resource. And mm -hmm. so at the the north, it's actually you know closer to twenty meters thick. Uh, and then the core is is about five meters uh, thick on on average. I so, meant I meant feet, but you're right. Sorry, yeah. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it's um it's it's incredibly thick. So the average thickness in in Mexico is about a meter and a half or, or two meters. So you know. Uh, four to six feet and uh and then ours you know uh, our average thickness at Copala is 30 feet so uh you know five times the average thickness let's say uh which is which is incredible you're right because it's challenging to mine narrow veins and you, you, like dilution can kill a high grade project for sure um and then you know our narrowest structure you know we do have a narrow structure that's Cristiano it's a meter and a half but it's incredibly high grade it's you know it's about a kilo, well, 900 grams in the inferred category where most of the ounces were in the last resource. And then um, we have, you know, so you can you can sustain a bit of dilution with those grades there. And then we have Tejitos, which is about three meters, um, Napoleon, which is three and a half meters. So the average thickness would be, you know, uh, well over uh, three meters, uh, probably closer to five meters on average. Uh, of our veins. And, and again, that's not typical in Mexico. Most, most companies, you know, that are operating can make 200 gram silver and uh, two meters thick work. Like uh, most of the Canadian silver mining companies operating in Mexico would be making something like that work. Um, fortunately for us, and this speaks to the potential of, of high margin, you know, we have a big structure that literally starts just below surface and you know so you don't have to drive to a shaft or you know huge uh, underground development costs and then the grades are very high too uh you know our, our average grade is about three times um even at the lower cutoff at the 150 gram cutoff you know is is about three times the average grade in of production in mexico but to me that means margin high margin and uh and then you know, at a higher cutoff, it's actually closer to, you know, 650 grams or 625 grams silver equivalent, which is, you know, that's, that's, that's really good grade, uh, on a global scale at, at Copal, it's even higher. It'd be closer to, uh, you know, 800 grams, I believe with a 250 gram cutoff. So that's like four times that average, uh, production grade on, on a structure that's five times the average thickness. So, um, getting down there is going to be key. key. I, I'm, that's probably the thing I'm most excited about for, for 2024. I mean, I'm very excited about the PEA. Um, but you know, there's many analysts out there that, uh, have given, you know, their rendition on what they think economics look like on, on, uh, on our Panuco project. I think we have seven, seven or eight analysts covering us. The, the most recent one is, uh, is CIBC, a Canadian bank has, 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 has launched coverage on us, which is the first, first bank. Um, but what we don't know. And it's always the the mystery that, that and the surprises that that create value, of course, for for shareholders. Uh, what we don't know is uh, what we're going to find when we start to do the test mining at Copala and Napoleon, uh, which is what we have planned for 2024. Um, you know, basically using old workings nearby Copala and Napoleon, uh, 
so utilizing the disturbed infrastructure there, the disturbed uh, land area, and then driving, uh, you know, uh, an adit basically from that old adit into Copala from a few hundred meters away. The, the suggest like what I what I think is possible there is that we end up finding new discoveries of veins that we don't know about on our way to to Copala. So. Um, and then it also shows that we have the ability, you know, to, to do that underground mining development. And also the, the, the real key for me is let's get our eyes and our hands on Copala and see how it reconciles with our, with our drilling so that we can properly plan the first few years of mining um, by looking and seeing the vein right away instead of just guessing, you know, through an estimate with, uh, with drill holes. Even tightly spaced drill holes isn't as good as, as um, getting right to the vein. Hmm. But so Kapala, Napoleon, that sort of where the focus is going to be sort of figuring out what's happening in, in between for next year. Are you planning on, on doing something else on so somewhere else on your land package? Um, the, the test mining will be focused on Napoleon and Kapala initially. And we don't have immediate plans to, to test mine anywhere else. Uh, the reason for that is, you know, we think we can actually sustain a, a pretty meaningful uh, mine rate from Copala and Napoleon. And, um, you know, so that is the most logical place to start development. Okay. Like, well, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Is it, how, how, how big of a program are we talking about in, in total more or less than this year? Um, so our, our drilling this year, uh, will, will likely be somewhere around the same level as we did this year. So we did 90,000 meters. We'll, we will compete 90,000, complete 90,000 meters in 2023. In 2024, um, you know, we're doing a great combination of uh, geotech and infill drilling, which is kind of the boring, more boring stuff. It's it's uh, what you need to do to de-risk the project. But at the same time, we're also doing a lot of discovery drilling. So we've got 2,500 meters planned for Malino. Uh, we've got a lot of meters planned for Copala. Um, we've got about 15,000 meters planned on different targets throughout the district that we haven't, um, you know, we haven't drill tested yet. And that's just the start. That's just a kind of an initial recon program. Any one of those that turns into a, a big discovery, you know, gets followed up almost immediately like we did with La Luisa, uh, where we now have two rigs turning on it. So, you know, I, I, I th I'm comfortable thinking that it's probably between 75,000 and a hundred thousand meters for, for 2024. Um, you know, we, we've we've done 120,000 in 2021. Uh, you know, 2022, we did another 110,000 meters, I think. And then, you know, we've done 90,000 this year. So we've done over 300,000 meters in um, in uh, in diamond drilling across the project. Another thing to note there that we did that with man portable drill rigs. Um, we never had to, to do our own road. We did this all with the existing infrastructure, which is just incredible. And then we did that well, having, you know, a 1.6 million uh, LTI free uh, hour uh, streak as well with a very low total recorded incident rate. So we did it very safely, even with man portable rigs and, and uh, you know, the the lack of, well, not the lack, but we, we didn't have to uh, build roads or anything. So it's, it's um, you know, really, really incredible. Mm. What are you drilling right now into uh, which target? Uh, so we have the six rigs. We have two on Copala. Um, we have one at Napoleon, and then we have uh, two at La Luisa, and then the other one is uh, is likely at El Molino today. Okay, nothing, nothing, and uh, I suppose I'm just gonna say four de Mayo, but I know I'm supposed to say Cuatro de Mayo, but uh, nothing <laughs> there. No, Cuatro de Mayo, uh, you know, it kind of edges up into uh, our, our neighbor's property there. And we made a good discovery, but, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, the lo I wish we could drill all these targets and just keep drilling. Like, you know, we had 12 rigs at one point, um, but we're, you know, we're now half of that. And we're doing the same amount of meters in a year, which just talks, speaks to our, our efficiency. Um you know, so we're more efficient with less rigs, but at the same time, you know, there's low hanging fruit at Copala, there's low hanging fruit at La Luisa and Napoleon. And we, we, um, you know, we, we, we just go where we're going to get rewarded in terms of ounces. And, you know, at the same time we are making new, like La Luisa is a great example. That was a new discovery this year. And, and then we've, we've just hit it hard with, with the rigs and it's grown rapidly. So we, we, we love to make the discoveries. We love to follow up with them. Um, but we're, you know, 
we're, we're, we're our, our resources are, are, um, required where we're, we're doing, you know, more expansion drilling versus, uh, you know, testing all these targets as, as much as we'd like to. The resources are focused on getting out the resource. It makes yeah. sense. It's, um, it's also year round drilling, I assume. Um, yeah. And so, but you said so. You've got six uh, rigs going on right now. You've you've been drilling at this temple for a while, as you mentioned. Is that is that also the plan for next year? Do you want to add another drill, or you know, take one out or something? It's kind of uh, objective specific. So you know, at one at some point, I'd like us to do this 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 drill fence, um, basically kind mm-hmm. of you know drilling across a, an area um, on 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 you know spaced out equally spaced out uh centers and um you know if we did that maybe we'd have to add a rig or two i'm not too sure it just now uh depends on what we're drilling you know where the rigs are are centered and and what's going on with with those rigs at the time um so you know at any time we can add rigs uh more rigs and and you know we've done that as i mentioned we've been up to 12 rigs historically um, but right now I think six rigs is, is, is good. It's, um, we're getting better turnaround times than we had in the past. So we're happy with, um, with how these rigs are performing. They're more efficient and, uh, we're getting great data. Mm. But fence drilling that you mentioned, wouldn't that be something for after the PEA or after the, the updated MRE? Yeah, it would likely be, uh, later in the year if it's mm. next year at all. Yeah. Okay. And anything, anything deeper that you're planning, or because I, I don't know how how deep is your deepest hole? Like I don't know, 100 meters something. Yeah, it's about 700 at Napoleon. Okay, uh, and that, and then it was open awesome. below that. Uh, um, but you know, I, total length like that would be you know from surface 700 meters. We've drilled you know kilometer long holes, you know on on angles. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, it's it's always better to to drill something closer to surface. I would say it's you know it's more bang for your buck. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we were tempted to do some deep holes. We definitely discussed that, you know, with Peter and, and Jesus, um, when I was there with them, uh, what was the last month and, uh, you know, we we're at dinner and talking about that and the idea is, yeah, let's, you know, we've got to test these things at depth and it's, it's exciting, right? Like that's, that's how they made the big discoveries at, uh, Juan Escipio, uh, drilling things deep. And, uh, we know that there's some, big heat source down there somewhere that's created all this huge amount of mineralization. So <clears throat> it, it does behoove us to drill some very deep exploratory holes at some point, but because that's a little bit more capital intensive, it, it's better to do a lot of, um, you know, pre-work on that. And, and so that's actually the, the work that Jesus and, um, and Peter have been working on. And to me, it's very exciting. And, uh, you know, at some point, you know, in the not too distant future, there might be a big headline on a press release that we, you know, we drilled into the, you know, the heat source and, uh, you know, very, uh, very unlikely that something like that wouldn't be heavily mineralized with high grade mineralization. Mm. Okay. It's, it's um, how much are you paying per meter, by the way, just before I forget? It's about $200. Actually, it's a little less than $200. It's gone down. So next year's drill program uh, is that is that camp and everything or is that the drillers only? That, that's all in, yeah. Okay, yeah. so about twenty million dollars you're going to need for next year if it's on the upper side, you know, one hundred one hundred thousand meters, twenty uh, by two hundred to twenty million. Yeah, that would be you know that would be kind of reasonable to think of if you know if we kind of go full speed that would be you know a budget you could you could have for uh, for drilling. Okay, and then G and E, where is that right now? I think. Um, well, but across Mexico and our, our team, that would be, um, you know, somewhere in the realm of like three to four million, I would say, for next year. Okay, three to four million a year. Okay, so 20, 23, 25 million dollars is, is what you're basically going to be needing. So you're either raising capital before that or you're selling off some of the investments uh, on the balance sheet. You do have, like, as I said, 20 million in, in accounts receivables. Is that something you expect to receive before next year? Uh, so that that would be our EVA our tax return. Mm. And, um, you know, we expect to get some millions back this year. I, I can't, you know, I can never guarantee how much it's going to be and when it's going to come from, from the Mexican government. But we've, we've already recovered 
you know, several million already from the government. We've had a had a lot of success with that so far. So I'm I'm hoping that we'll have some more hit the hit the balance sheet by the end of the year. Um, we've got about 30 million in the bank right now. So, you know, we are funded for, uh, you know, theoretically, if we went to zero, we'd be funded basically for the next year. Um, but we are certainly funded for our operational milestones, like the, the MRE, uh, mineral resource update, and then the, uh, the PEA uh, plan for next year as well. Mm. Having mentioned the investments, how are you going to, uh, there's, you marked them as 40 million on your balance sheet. Is that something you're 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 capable and and willing and or ready to to liquidate in order to finance more drilling if it's if it's needed? So so those would just be um, you know treasury bills or, or an instrument that we have short term um, deposits and earn an interest on with our cash. Um, so it's essentially our, our balance sheet cash that, cash that we use. Um, we don't have any other investments other than um, you know Prismo stock, which I, I don't recall how much that would be worth right now. We paid for $2 million for it. It would be a little less than that. We don't have any intention on, on selling that. Um, so, you know, we're, we're in a position here where, um, you know, I, I, we have a number of really solid um, releases to go out in, in milestones like the, the, the update and then the PEA. And then we're really not, you know, necessarily beholden uh, to finance until well into 2024. Um, you know, we're exploring a few different options, you know, we're exploring, uh, the potential, you know, of, of, uh, strategic investment. Uh, we've, we've, uh, explored that as a board and we, you know, we've looked at, I always say, unfortunately in this business, you've got to dilute something, right? You have to dilute equity to finance or you have to dilute the project. Um, you know, and a way to, to finance, to dilute the project could be a stream, so you could look at, um, you know, doing a stream or a royalty or things like that. Not necessarily something we want to do at, at this early stage. Um, you know, so, but we're, we're fortunate. We've got very supportive and, um, you know, successful investors as our, our cornerstone investors. So, you know, we can certainly go back to, um, to our existing uh, shareholder registry that includes directors as well. You know, we've, as I said, we've, We've put about five million, I would say, over the last uh, couple of years into the company, whether it's through buying on the market or, um, or direct through placements. So we're, you know, we we as a company, we we um, like to think that we're we're fairly capable in the in the capital markets. You know, we've had a, a record of raising a couple hundred million dollars for for Visla already. We're New York listed, which helps as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, with, with my other hat on Inventa Capital, the, the company I started with Craig Perry, you know, we've raised, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars for, for portfolio companies as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenging market. No one will, you know, anyone who tells you differently is probably lying. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, we're confident that a project like ours and our experience, you know, is, is, um, useful when it comes to uh to raising capital for for visa well, but it is a challenging market and it's also something that i'm thinking about do you, how do you take that into account as a ceo and how, how do you balance that where you can say like oh let's maybe you know push the pa even further out and wait for a recovery in the market like is that something you 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 you, you can allow yourself to do or are you willing to do and then about raising capital because you say you want to raise capital after the pa can you afford to wait until the market has improved? Because again, you said, I mean, you th those are your words. You called yourself criminally undervalued, and so, yeah. How do how do you how do you manage the the you know sentiment on the market? Yeah, you know, I, I, unfortunately, um, I, you know, I think a CEO uh, should focus on making sure the company is running well, and 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 not so much the share price every day. You know, we we look at our share price, we. You know, we benchmark ourselves against the peers, and and when we benchmark ourselves against the peers, we're actually outperforming our peers, which is to say that we're, you know, it's unfortunate because if even the peers are, are are struggling, everybody's struggling right now in terms of uh, in terms of the market, and um, you know, but I I I expect that you know these milestones will will create value for the company. I think you know going into to next year will be uh, better than this year. You know, this is tax loss selling. It's, you know, a, a, a buyer strike. There's very few buyers, it seems, and uh, a lot of algorithmic trading that, I, that I've noticed in, in stocks. 
as well. And, and so, you know, I think um, I expect 2024 to be a positive year for the company. And I, I think going into the end of the year will be uh, better, you know, better days in terms of share price as well. But of course, that's just my my guess. I, I don't have a crystal ball and I'm, I'm not making any, um, you know, recommendations or anything like that. But, um, you know, I, I do know that we have a lot of great uh, news items and, and uh, you know, potentials to, to re-rate uh, you know, going into 2024 and then beyond. Mm. The, it, it, it absolutely is a challenging market, though, to manage it. I, I cannot even imagine it's being challenging for me, my own small little portfolio. So I can only imagine what's on your end. What is, how, how are you, we mentioned Prismo Metals. You can also just walk me through how you're thinking about that investment there. I mean, is it, is this potentially taking it over or again, speculating here, but what do you, what do you want to do with it? Well, you know, there's there's uh, there's a lot of value in that concession. Um, you know, we've done some good drilling with Prismo, and Prismo's done some good drilling. And um, you know, there's there's uh, you know the makings of a, a probably a meaningful amount of ounces there in a resource. Um, we have a rofer on the property, so in, at some point we we will we likely will acquire that that property. Um, right now, it's not necessarily as pressing. We you know we like the work that Prismo is doing. And the other great thing is that we have exposure to the Pavitos project in, in uh, Sonora and Gold project that they have, and then uh, the Hot Breccia, which is a copper project that they have in Arizona. And uh, you know Peter McGoss involved in, in Prismo, great team there, Craig Gibson. Um, so we're happy with uh, with our investment there. Um, at some point, it'll make sense for us to acquire Palos Verdes, but our focus really. You know, it was in the West there with Copala, Napoleon, uh, you know, our resource, and then and Palos Verdes is basically on the opposite end of the, the district in the East. Mm. Okay. Okay. Well, there is a plan there. That's for sure. I think I'm, um, I've mostly gone through the most of the stuff that I wanted to ask you. What is it? What am I forgetting to ask you? Tell me something I don't know. Oh, the, well, you, you, so far we, we've covered a lot of the, you know, the great things, but. I think, you know, one thing I like to highlight, and it's not always immediately uh, apparent, but we have a very strong team in country, um, you know, led by Martin Dupuy, our COO, who spent years at Pan American, uh, Jesus Velador, uh, you know, Fresnillo alumni, uh, worked for Fortuna, for First Majestic, you know, for Pinoles, for kind of all the marquee names in uh in Mexico, uh, Fernando Martinez, our director of projects, you know, uh, ex Agnico, ex First Majestic, ex uh, Cisco Development in Mexico. Um, so, you know, steady hand there when it comes to mine planning. Um, Jesus Valador, I talked about him. Hernando Riuda, um, another PhD. Jesus and, and Hernando are both PhDs. Um, you know, he, he, he's worked at a senior level with Agnico and Capstone and really is, is doing a great job in, in our. Uh, uh, our operations down in Mexico. And then on the board side, uh, really important to highlight Simon Smirlik. Simon is the chief operating officer, COO of Osenko Engineering. And Osenko Engineering is basically the kind of the world's premier mine builder. They, they were just acquired for about $600 million um, recently by a private equity firm. And, um, you know, Simon and, and, and Osenko, they built Las Chispas for Silvercrest. And, you know, they build all the kind of mega mines down there in, in, uh, in Chile and Peru. I always like to say that Simon's built more mines than most people in this industry have ever visited, um, including Goro. He was heavily involved in Goro, which is one of the world's largest mines, uh, nickel mine in, in, uh, in Southeast Asia. And, um, you know, Simon is, is incredibly insightful, uh, very helpful for us on the board. And, you know, we, we now, you know, as we're preparing for this PA, we have weekly calls to, to go over these, these things. And um, th that's important. It's important to highlight that because people say, you know, well, do you really want to build it? Can you build it? Um, you, are you just going to sell it to whoever comes along? Simon's involvement is, um, you know, I think a very strong indication that we have the capability, the wisdom, the experience to, uh, you know, to build a mine like this. Mm. Are you planning any more hires next year in 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 lieu of the uh, PEA or before or after? Well, you know, there's probably some people uh, that come into play uh, on the mine planning and uh, the development. If we you know start to do the underground test mining, uh, but you know, as far as our our corporate um, you know chart, your organizational chart, uh, you know, it's pretty pretty uh, well suited for what we're doing right now. Mm. Operational knowledge and all that as well. 
Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. When all this is done, and this is arm waving, and feel free to ignore my question. But how, how big do you want to do you want this thing to be, or like, is there any guidance that you can give me a good feeling, something along those lines? Well, again, you know, we started off talking about Sandimas. I, I think you know, go back to that Sandimas, uh, six hundred million ounces of silver, eleven million ounces of gold. Uh, six. I'll say that again: six hundred million ounces of silver. 11 million ounces of gold, it still produces 12 million ounces of, of silver equivalent annually. Um, I think that something like that is possible here at, uh, at Panuco. Mm. So I'd like to see this, you know, become uh, a billion ounce district. That's our, our goal. That's our stretch target. And then, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, an aspiration of producing, you know, up to 20 million ounces of, of silver equivalent annually, if, if that's ever possible here. So, um, mm. you know, those are our kind of our, our big goals and what we, what we look to do. I'm not saying that that's guaranteed or that will necessarily happen, but I think it's, it's quite possible. And, and, and uh, you know, already with the resource that we have and, you know, this upcoming resource and the hundred million ounces that was taken out of, um, out of Animas and, and other areas in the, in the district, you know, this has well on its way of becoming that billion ounce silver equivalent district. Oh wow, the whole district building. What is? Are there? Do you have any other examples like Santa Imus, maybe that that they were sold or something that would help me sort of value it on on what, what is what are companies paying for those ounces in the ground? Well, you know, I, I think um, with with Santa Mass, it's it's part of First Majestic, and it's they're kind of top mine, so it'd be mm -hmm. probably half their market cap, I would say, which is I think around two and a half billion right now. Um, and then you could look at, uh, you could look at Meg Silver, which is about a billion and a half dollar company. It's a comparable project to ours. Although I think our, our resource will, well, there's a couple of things about, about Meg Silver. One is that it's a, a joint venture between, uh, Fresnillo and Meg. So they own about 44, they own 44% of, of Juan Escipio, and it's still a, you know, one and a half billion dollar company. And, uh, you know, we own hundred percent of our district. We have hundred percent control of, of where we're going and what we want to do with it versus having to deal with a, another mining company. Um, and, uh, and then you can look at Silvercrest, which is, you know, recent production, high grade silver, although far narrower veins, um, than, than what we have, um, you know, that's a, you know, was a billion dollar plus company for, for a long time. And, and now it's, you know, high, high hundreds of millions, um, Again, you know, that's a project, not a district. We have a district here, uh, very, you know, dissimilar in that sense, but the similarities come into the high grade and uh, pathway to production there. And so if you look at the EV per ounce of those two companies, it's just under $5 right now. And mm -hmm. I've seen that number as high as $15 in the past EV per ounce for, for our peers. Um, we traded about 90 cents EV per ounce. And so we're about, you know, 20% of, uh, of the value that those companies get. So I confident that there's a four to five X value increase on our, our, our ounces just by de-risking and developing this project the same way that, that Silvercrest and, uh, and, and uh, Meg has in the, have in the past. And so um, when I look at that and I look at the upcoming resource numbers and the, you know, the pathway to what I think is possible here in this district, that's why I get to the the point where I say we're criminally undervalued. Mm. Do you think that the PEA is that sort of catalyst that brings you to a, a de-risk spot or the, the place that you're talking about here? Yeah, I, I, it's part of it. Um, you know, it's part of the analysis that we did as a, as a board and a team to see what, you know, is this something that we should be doing? So we looked at, um, you know, the history, history of, uh, of, of Silvercrest and, and Meg and others that have gone before it. And the charts are actually very similar. Stock charts between Vizsla, Silvercrest and Meg are very similar. We have kind of excitement and, and exuberance over discovery. And then uh, the, the chart comes back to reality after a few years, like ours did, um, and consolidates along a, a low for a cer certain period of time. And then it kind of explodes and builds out of, um, uh, out of that low to all new highs, all time highs. Uh, same thing happened. I mean, that happened with Silvercrest. That happened with Meg. Our chart is starting to look like that. Very, very clearly looking similar to that right now. And I think there's a couple of things that that um, you know that stimulate that that improvement. One is uh, you know yeah definitely the PEA and showing economics and showing that it's viable. Uh, but it's also de-risking in the sense of you know what we're planning with the underground test mining and then various other things like 
you know, that underground test mining would be dem- demonstrative of that, the fact that we, we would have permits. So permitting is important. Um, and then, you know, as you get kind of more and more, uh, where the market understands that you're, you're, you know, you're, you have a true pathway to, to production, you know, then you have speculation around takeovers and things like that. And, and that generally starts to drive a market as well. Um, so, you know, I suspect, I don't like, I don't think that we're, our share price is going to be at this level for very long. I think this is a good opportunity for, for investors to, uh, to buy at these levels because, you know, what I've seen historically with, with our peer companies is that, you know, the next coming months and years are, are very um, rewarding uh, in terms of share price. Well, I'll be following along and I'll make sure to follow up on that um, in the coming months. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for investing your time with me. This was great. Well, thank you, Antonio. I appreciate it.